Hi, my name is David McEwen. I work for Brown and Caldwell, and I'm happy to present to you another chapter in the new Odor Emissions and Control Manual of Practice number 25. This is my copy here. Uh, this is a chapter on odor impact assessments. Uh, the outline for this chapter is the following. You see these are the major sections. Introduction talking about maybe why we would do these kind of assessments. Odor source types. Talk a bit about odor dispersion modeling because these dispersion models are really probably the best way to actually establish what offsite impacts the extent of them and potentially what you can do to minimize them. In fact, actually the picture that you see on the cover of the manual of practice is a dispersion model output plot. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in that section that I'll go over. A little bit about air containment and extraction design, facility odor evaluations, and finally, uh, just a quick case study, one of two that is in the chapter of this manual of practice. So, but I'll start out with uh, that background section of, and really why conducting odor impact assessments is important. So, I mean, the first two are pretty obvious. There may be existing uh, complaints by nearby residences or people that work in commercial areas, or even you see sometimes people just driving on the road uh, uh, that go by there every day, calling in and complaining. So there's that, and that's the obvious thing, but also preventing public complaints is another thing that may drive one of these studies, knowing that let's say there's gonna be, let's say a new golf course, like uh, what you see there in the, uh, in the first picture. If that's coming and you know that's coming, then maybe some sort of an odor impact assessment would be good. A lot of times farther down the road for some of these larger plants, there are regulatory permitting requirements. You wanna find out, well, what, how are odors impacting this? And what can I do to comply? Uh, and then at the end, uh, the way to use best, I think the odor impact assessments is determining capital improvement program projects. Uh, these are things that will ultimately reduce odor impacts off-site, control them at the most efficient, uh, efficient, in the most efficient way. So with that, I will talk about another section of the chapter and these odor source types. Uh, there are three different types that we consider when doing these assessments and that we input into these dispersion models. The first is probably the easiest one to understand and they're point sources. So this is a very one dimensional uh, uh, kind of source. Uh, the obvious thing would be uh, any sort of an exhaust from, you see there, there are two uh, bio uh, scrubbers, biological scrubbers there and at the top each one is, has a stack and the point source indicates that the air is coming out. Now, that may be that, or it could be, now that's a controlled source, but there also may be uncontrolled sources, such as an HVAC system that's exhausting air from a building. Well, if there are odorous uh, things inside, then, then certainly that may be an odor source as well. Even manholes uh, can be an odor source, and the, the pick holes, the cracks, very high hydrogen sulfide concentrations oftentimes, especially in these long collection systems and flat, and they can come out there and, and that also can be modeled as a point source. These guys, uh, these point sources are uh, easily char characterized by a measurable velocity and they're the easiest thing to model. Now, kind of on the other uh, side of the spectrum, there are these area sources. Now, these area sources, uh, I mean, obviously, based upon the name, they encompass a decent area. Uh, and they can be things like primary clarifiers. The picture on the right there are these very large uh, sludge settling basins, uh, even, even biofilters. Again, again, an odor control system itself can be an odor source. In fact, it is to some degree an odor source because it's gonna release some odor emissions, even if it's working very well. But if it's not working very well, then that could become a major odor source. Uh, 
Uh, the challenge with these sources is the emission rate. I mean, unlike a point source where there is a constant velocity uh, and a constant airflow rate, uh, here with these area sources, you've got obviously a large area and you have to determine what the flux is coming off. That can be a little more challenging. And sometimes that can even be overstated in models if let's say we assume that an entire primary clarifier odor emission flux is what's happening right there at the weir and at the launderer. That's where it's the most volatile, um, which is, is a higher odor, but it isn't necessarily that odor over the course of the entire uh, primary. So oftentimes we have to separate the two. So the last odor source type is a volume source. This is also kind of intuitive. You've got these rooms that are uh, open potentially at least to the atmosphere. A great example are uh, bays where uh, cake, biosolids cake is loaded into trucks. Um, and oftentimes what you're looking at there are inconsistent airflow rates. And I'll also add inconsistent emission rates because uh, oftentimes, uh, in the case of both of these examples, as a matter of fact, these two pictures, the emission rate is much, much larger when the cake is falling down from the bin down into the truck. And, and you could have this poof of odor emissions, right, coming out of the, uh, of the bay door if you keep the bay door closed, or sorry, open, right? If you keep it closed, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's fine, and it may be drive to a point source, HVAC emission. But if you have it open, then that could be an issue, and sometimes that is ignored in models because it's not an obvious odor source. Or there may be the assumption that, oh, yeah, they keep the doors closed all the time, but maybe they don't. And that could become an issue uh, of off-site odor impacts to think about. Okay, so those are the odor sources. Now, a little bit about dispersion models. Uh, here are three of them. I don't mean to say that these are the only three, but AirMod is the US EPA approved model. Uh, it, it has a, a, a function of a three-dimensional uh, Gaussian plume. It uses calculations to determine uh, impacts offsite uh, at any individual location, at least at the locations that you specify in a grid. However tight you want the grid to be is how many points that it will uh, identify the odor concentration um, or frequency of odor emissions. We'll talk about that in a second at that individual point. Now, the uh, AirMod is the EPA approved model. Uh, it is not, though, as good as maybe some other models for short term impacts or uh, impacts near the fence line. It's more of a grand scheme type of thing to show over the uh, the long term, you know, if you've got a primary clarifier, these are the emissions over the long term with these various weather conditions. This is the kind of impact that we would be expecting offsite. CalPuff is another model. It's a US EPA preferred model, and that's just jargon for saying that this, these are not typically used for regulatory purposes, or at least those uh, where compliance is, uh, is, is needed. 50 and 200 kilometers from the source is the range. Um, CalPuff is very good at what they refer to as kind of unusual weather conditions, stagnation, uh, wind reversal, and these different meteorological variations, including in, in uh, uh, layers of um, where the, the uh, air is kind of packed down onto the ground. And that can keep vertical dispersion at a minimum. Inversion layer uh, is, is the meteorological term for that and that can lead to higher odor impacts. CalPuff does a good job of that. Now, screen three is a screening model. It's just a, a, a point source, a single point source model that it, it provides general approximations, but it doesn't have the elaborate input, especially the meteorological input that the first two have. But it's good for approximations and general kind of uh, tummy rub type stuff of Okay, how bad can this source possibly be odor-wise? So those are the types of dispersion models. Now, here's some output. Gave you a little bit of a, a indication in that first slide uh, and on the cover of the book, what kind of an output, you know, what it might look like. Here's one, and the inputs, flow rates, stack dimensions for point sources, uh, met data, 
terrain and building data. Now, the output is these isoplets, or at least this is one of the types of output. Isoplets being lines of consistent odor impact. So let's say uh, the orange line uh, indicates that the odor impacts are, uh, at that point, maybe 10 parts per billion of H2S, something like that. Well, uh, and that goes less and less as you get further and further from the source. In this case, further and further from this facility, solid waste facility. And the reason it looks like a bullseye is because there isn't a lot of meteorological uh, uh, variation over the course of the year. And partly that's because of how flat the area is. But there isn't entirely a prevailing wind direction, so it kind of goes out in a bullseye. But on the next slide, you'll see an odor dispersion model plot that's very different. And it almost can kind of show you there that, well, obviously the prevailing wind direction is north and south as opposed to east and west. Uh, same kind of airflow rate impact input, and, and, and these are the off-site uh, odor contours, but they look very different, right? So, and it can go out as far as you want and go down to levels of, of the threshold of odor detection. But the reality is what you want to look at is close to the fence line. So with those models uh, in play, we're able to use those uh, and, and determine what the off-site off impacts are in areas of significance. Now, here's an area, something to note, where you see the plant boundary there, almost looks like a I guess a, a quote, a quote on the, the right side quote there. You see the, the, uh, the red line is the boundary, but around it is effectively a buffer zone, right? So instead of one of the things you put in to a dispersion model input is where the fence line is. And impacts beyond the fence line count. Well, here, impacts can be behind, beyond the fence line and, and be you know, in a waterway or in an open field. Well, we may not care about that. So we may draw the uh, uh, fence line, you know, uh, uh, in that uh, alternate location in order to be able to find a better, more realistic in indication of what the impacts actually are. Okay, so when you have the dispersion model all set, inputs and outputs, and your buffer zone or, or your uh, boundary, uh, you run it. And uh, well, on the next slide, you'll see kind of an indication of what you're going to get. Now, odor contours, uh, the one on the left there is areas of consistent odor. This is what the odor is going to be, uh, worst case scenario, going off site. And contours are uh, either represented in odor units uh, or in parts per billion of some compound. Oftentimes it's H2S, a very common odorous compound. But there's also exceedance plots. So if you have as a goal, 10 odor units at the fence line. You can also plot how many times that odor threshold, in this case, let's say 10, occurs over the course of the year. You can see in that second plot there, there are uh, areas where it exceeds that maybe 800 times. You may have a goal, uh, they only exceed 88 times a year. That'd be 1% of the year, 88 hours. So those are the two plots. Now, uh, other things that you can get from dispersion models. You can uh, identify specifically uh, uh, what sources themselves are uh, contributing the most to the offsite impacts or to these yearly exceedances. And, and that helps target your uh, future odor control projects, right? I mean, here it's obvious that uh, those first two sources, septage receiving, a volume source, a point source, sludge into watering, that's scrubbers that eh, aren't working very well. And you can see that those are major and you certainly are gonna wanna do more for them than let's say the aeration tank. So it helps kind of prioritize uh, projects. Uh, another thing that you can draw from these, uh, these projects on the next slide, is uh, the uh, best odor control uh, options, right? So you select the most impactful sources, you consider upstream or liquid phase uh, treatment, consider a phased approach, and you could actually see in these dispersion models, okay, you do the highest impact odor sources first, or do the things that are just the easiest to fix, the shortest schedule. 
And we can see uh, when you put in all of these uh, uh, you know, uh, phased approaches, you can see the improvement over time. So if you look at the next slide, we'll, uh, we'll see uh, a, 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 the initial part of the uh, odor assessment, basically, for the individual sources. And specifically, what are you going to do about it? Think about the type of containment. A flat cover or a dome cover is tighter than you see that hood there. You're going to consider NFPA 820 requirements for fire safety. Occupied spaces are going to have uh, requirements for worker comfort and things like that. So considering that and moving on into uh, the, 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 the remainder of the odor impact assessment, you're going to uh, then take on the next slide all of that into account and determine what the best technology is for uh, treatment. Now, there are a couple ways of doing this. Uh, in fact, both are typically incorporated. You've got your life cycle cost analysis, looking at not only how much does it cost to construct the thing, but how much does it cost to operate it. And we can compare various technologies, like the ones that you see in that table there, on a present worth basis. There's also non-economic considerations. You see there, footprint, complexity, and then the capital operating costs can be thrown into that same thing, just to get kind of a picture. Now, don't take this as gospel. These are just, for one specific project, what we feel are the most impactful uh, uh, elements, conditions, non-economic considerations. And it may be different for another project. But anyway, that, that helps decide what technology is important. Okay. Going on to the next slide, now we've, we've figured out what the uh, impacts are and how do we know how good of a job we did. Well, here's a case study that is one of the two in the, uh, in, in the chapter. This is where they had a phased approach and they addressed it, the highest odor contributor first. And that was the septage receiving. We saw that in the table a, a few slides back. Okay, so the odor contours, you look at there, and you look at that first plot, look how far out they go. Just by putting in a carbon absorber for that source and improving the exhaust orientation. So what they had before was not only non-treatment, but also a horizontal exhaust. Well, horizontal exhausts are the worst case scenario for offsite impacts. And it's intuitive, right? It, it, you, you shoot the air in the direction of uh, a, a residence, let's say, that's the most minimal uh, vertical dispersion that you can have. So uh, when that happens, you are providing the most limited amount of dispersion. Now, not only is this source being treated, the air being treated, but it's also being exhausted at an ideal uh, velocity, which is typically more than 2,000 feet per minute, coming out the stack. All of that is good for off-site impact reduction. And you see that in the, in the second uh, plot. So uh, that is the, uh, that's the summation overview of chapter 11. Uh, no bankruptcy jokes uh, needed uh, because it doesn't actually require a business to be in chapter 11 to follow the, the guidelines here for odor impact assessments. Um, any questions you may have, feel free to uh, email me. Contact information uh, is, is available um, right here. And thanks very much for the opportunity. Hopefully everybody is having a great time uh, at Left Tech Connect. Thank you.